During his transition into the Oval Office after being elected as president in 2008, Barack Obama's Change.gov website spelled out his agenda on the protection of whistleblowers. Here's what it said. Often the best source of information about waste, fraud, and abuse in government is an existing government employee committed to public integrity and willing to speak out. Such acts of courage and patriotism, which can sometimes save lives and often save taxpayer dollars, should be encouraged rather than stifled. My next guests were not encouraged when they tried to expose abuse in government. They got fired, treated as criminals. Thomas Drake is a former executive at the National Security Agency. He was charged under the Espionage Act after he blew the whistle on waste and illegal activity. Jessalyn Radick is a former ethics advisor to the Department of Justice. She's also a whistleblower. She's now the National Security and Human Rights Director at the Government Accountability Project, a leading whistleblower organization. Thanks both of you for being here. Thomas, let me start with you. When the news broke that the agency you used to work for, the NSA, was spying on its own citizens and collecting massive amounts of data, everything from our phone calls and photos that we take on our iPhones, everything. How surprised were you? Not at all. You were not surprised? No. It's become routine. We now have a systemic, institutionalized surveillance system and, and so on an this, industrial scale. This massive collection of data, we're told, don't worry about it, nobody's actually looking at all that stuff. How confident are you that nobody is looking? Or, let me ask you this, can they look at it if they just wanted to one day? Yes, because they've collected it. So it's collected, it's stored. If somebody wants to say, wonder what old Mike Huckabee's been Googling lately, they could find that out. Extremely tempting to do so, especially when you have access to all that kind of information about everything about you in your entire life, and who, an index of your digital life. And who can keep someone from going in and looking at those files? Right now, there's no controls at all to speak of, because it's all in secret, and any of the controls they talk about are all in secret. They're not available for public review or debate. Now, you blew the whistle on things you saw in the NSA that you thought were going haywire. You were charged now with espionage. The president said that you should be a hero. That you should be rewarded for that. He said that in 2008 as a campaign platform. Four years later, his campaign platform touted, boasted about the number of leakers, whistleblowers, and toothers he had gone after, more so than all other administrations combined. How has it affected you? Obviously, you, know, you lost your job. What, what's it done to your career? Turned it upside down, inside out. How long were you with the NSA? I was with the NSA from 2001. First day on the job was 9-11. I resigned in 2008. And what, what are the job prospects? I mean, it's a tough economy, but for a guy that blew the whistle on the NSA that ought to be a hero and the president said we ought to reward you, tell me your reward. Uh, persona non grata. You're blacklisted. You can't find a job in the government because they charge you with espionage. Jessalyn, I want to uh, ask you about your case. You advised the Justice Department in the John Walker Lynn American Taliban case. You thought he, his rights were being abused. Uh, did that get you applause from your superiors? Um, it, it didn't get any reaction at first. They agreed with my analysis initially. Obviously, any American who's being subject to that um, is and, and read their rights. And let's make wife. clear, Jessalyn, you, you had advised that because he had counsel, mm -hmm. that any interrogation had to require that his counsel be present. I mean, exactly. I, I learned that in civics class in the ninth grade. So that's what you said. This guy has to, was his counsel present when he was interrogated? No, I had advised that on Friday and then I came in on Monday and the criminal section told me, oops, the FBI interrogated him anyway, what should we do now? And at that point I advised that the interrogation information needed to be sealed and they were welcome to use it for national security and intelligence gathering but not for criminal prosecution. Of course, they went ahead and used it for criminal prosecution. So you objected to that, and what happened? Um, I, I discovered, inadvertently discovered, that there was a, um, a court order for all Justice Department correspondence related to his interrogation. And when I went to check the file of all the emails I wrote, it had been purged. Um, so evidence, in essence. I mean, exactly. that would be evidence. That was would be destroyed. Evidence. Yes, that would be evidence, and it had disappeared. I resurrected it from my computer archives and I wrote a memo to my boss and I attached it and I said I have no idea why this was not around. I took home 
I, you know, I, I gave it to my boss. I resigned. I said, I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to be a part of it. I took home a copy in case it disappeared again, mm. which evidently it did. Uh, when we come back, the Washington culture of rewarding those who are helping cover up the scandals. You won't believe it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The federal government has ruined the lives of those who blew the whistle, and it's rewarding those who are trying to cover it up. Vincent Cefalu was a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. He was the one who exposed the Fast and Furious operation that sold guns to criminals in Mexico. The former number two boss at ATF, Todd Jones, allegedly helped cover up the scandal. He's been nominated by the president to direct the agency, and he's got a confirmation hearing scheduled later this month. Joining me now is Vincent Cefalu. Uh, Vincent, this is just a, a remarkable, uh, stunning story. You blew the whistle on Fast and Furious when it happened. What was the result of that? Were you thanked for uh, telling the truth and coming forward and explaining what a horrible fiasco this was? Uh, there was many that came forward um, in concert with my actions. Um, hoping to change the culture in the bureau and, and stop the culture of fear and intimidation and along the, right along the lines, every one of them had been punished, suffered great personal and professional uh, damages and it continues to this day. Vincent, you've been a career guy with the ATF. Now the interesting thing is you're still on the payroll, is that correct? That is correct, sir. They, they haven't actually got rid of you, but what do they have you doing for them now? Uh, they haven't gotten rid of me, not for lack of trying. Um, currently, I'm assigned as the senior operations officer for the San Francisco Field Division, performing the duties from my residence while the government fights the government over the outcome of the proposed actions they've tried to take against me. Now, they did fire you at one time and then realized they really didn't have any basis, so they reinstated you, but they have you doing basically nothing. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Uh, I'm sitting, waiting for the, the lawyers to figure out how they're going to back out of this situation. You know, Vincent, uh, I, I think about this. We're, taxpayers are paying your salary. The ATF doesn't want you to do anything. They obviously probably don't want you talking to me either on national television. Uh, but I appreciate your willingness to come forward. You've risked your career. You've had a good career. Uh, I've read things about you from your peers who say you're one of the best, toughest, most fearless agents ATF had. What's this done to your career, your life? What, what's happened to you? Well, it's devastated, obviously, me personally, um, my family. That's the point I want to make is it's not just the agents or the people who step forward to try to correct or, or right the wrongs. Uh, the families suffer, friends. Uh, and it's this whole failure of accountability that's just mind-boggling and, and how the attorneys and the, the government supports this kind of conduct. I don't know how they expect to change the, the fear and the air of fear and reprisal when they continue doing it. Todd Jones was a supervisor at ATF. He's now up to be the head of ATF. His uh, hearing will be happening soon. The president has a lot of confidence in him. Uh, should we be concerned that here's a guy who knew about Fast and Furious, according to many sources, including you, helped cover it up. Now he's going to lead the agency? Well, it's not just that issue. I, I mean, he came in at the end of it. Clearly, he was handed a mess. But it's more important than what he's done since he's been our acting director and the amplified air of fear and retaliation um, and that the issues that have continued to this day, the, the attacks on agents uh, like Jay Dobbins, who's going to trial in his case on Monday. They have more than ample evidence of corruption, unethical conduct, and there's no fail-safe. The people, the, the government attorneys who are supposed to be that, that fail-safe or that second set of eyes are continuing to protect corruption and mismanagement. And it's not going to change as long as these managers don't ever face accountability. Jessica, you were an attorney in the Department of Justice. How, how shocked are you when you hear what 
uh, Vince has to say about his own situation in the ATF. Well, since I've been a whistleblower attorney, I am not shocked at all. At all. It's actually quite typical um, that you are forced from your job, your security clearance is pulled, often you're referred for a mental examination, um, then no, you're no longer pulling in income and at the same time you're racking up legal fees because you've probably gotten a lawyer or some people like Vince are put in, you know, transferred to that what we call the paper cup stacking position in your office where mm. you're, you're doing nothing and still on the government payroll I've represented people who've been in that situation for years um, uh, but it really it does ruin your life and it does completely derail your career for example most people in his position need a security clearance in order to work for the government sure well, stay with us uh, because, look, the widespread infection of corruption, it's not limited to the federal government. Coming up, we're going to talk to a local public executive who speaks out on being admonished for hiring white people. That's next. Andre Harris is a former Department of Justice civil rights attorney, and he recently was the executive director of the Public Employees Relations Board of the District of Columbia. He resigned just last week in protests, he says, because board members repeatedly urged that white and right-of-center applicants not be hired. Andre, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, you quit because you thought some things were happening that just weren't right. Tell me what happened at the agency that you just decided was more than you wanted to be a part of. Well, uh, on November the 8th, 2012, uh, in a meeting at the agency, um, uh, several board members said things that I found uh, offensive. Uh, one of the things was that uh, I should refrain from hiring white attorneys in the office to fill the attorney advisor's positions, um, and that I should refrain from hiring a person who they deemed right of center or conservative, uh, a female, Erin Wilcox, and that I should not hire her. I told them that that was illegal and unconstitutional and that I would not do that. And I tendered my resignation at that time. Uh, you know, Andre, it, it's shocking. I want to give uh, you an opportunity to respond because the board has issued a statement. It's saying, the current board action has always been focused on Mr. Harris's refusal to comply with the law. At no time has the board communicating any interest, notice, or agenda to the contrary, notwithstanding as a result of Mr. Harris's unproven allegations of discrimination against the board, we are now required to refer this matter for investigation. I'd like for you to respond to what they said. You were the one doing illegal things. Right. Uh, Governor, what's important is here, here is what they don't say. They never deny that the statements were made. And I provided you with the smoking gun. The December 19, 2012 memo written by agency's counsel. Uh, keep in mind, agency counsel represents the board. I was the head of the agency, but it didn't, she didn't represent me. And in her memo, uh, she advised the board that what they were doing was illegal and they had to cease and desist. If you look at one, uh, uh, portion of the memo, she says it's patent, patently uh, impermissible to d discriminate against people because of their political affiliations and that the board could not retaliate against me for refusing to oppose their discriminatory practices of, or directives of not hiring white males. Andre, you know, th this sort of goes in sync with what we've been hearing coming out of the IRS, that there was targeted uh, efforts toward people who maybe had a political viewpoint that some of the IRS folks didn't like. Do we need to be worried as American citizens that in all levels, local and even federal levels, uh, the rights and the concerns of people are being stomped all over? We think of this as being a local uh, problem, but you know, Article One, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress uh, complete authority over uh, the Washington, D.C. It's, it's a federal territory. It's not a state. So your federal tax dollars are going to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, via Congress, and those tax dollars are being wasted on discriminatory practices. 
Uh, Andre, stay with us. We're going to keep you and uh, Jessalyn, Thomas, and Vince all together. And when we come back, uh, we'll talk about just how big this is, why you ought to be concerned about it, and what you can do about it. Stay with us. We are back with those who literally risk their lives and careers to tell the truth about their government. Jessalyn, what happens when people like you, like Thomas and others, tell your story? You know, I think if you say anything or push any idea that the administration doesn't like, or if you embarrass the administration, or God help you if you expose a crime of the administration, you will become the enemy. You will be targeted and likely subject to an espionage charge, as have been my clients like Tom Drake. And Tom, when you spoke out at NSA, you did so obviously that cost you your job now, an, an indictment. Obviously, somebody in NSA were the ones who let go this information. The, the Washington Post and the UK Guardian didn't get it on their own. Somebody gave it to them. Does that tell you there are other people, your former colleagues, who've had enough? Yes. And so what can we expect? Are more people going to stand up and say, look, this is, this is out of control. We can't let this happen. I would hope so. We need maximum exposure and disclosure on a government that is unchaining itself from the very Constitution it is bound to protect. And that constitutional republic can not long endure if we have a government that's out of control and is actually hammering people for simply telling the truth and standing up for what's right and for the law. And, and Vince, to you, I, well, I agree with you, Thomas, and our audience obviously does too. Vince, one of the things that become very apparent, it's not just what you said and what you have told, but why? And I want to get to that. Why did you go uh, public? Why did you tell the story? and expose things that you thought were wrong? Primarily because it had gotten out of control, it become institutional, widespread, um, and become a practice rather than the um, exception of the rule. It became the, the way of doing business. Je Joycelyn, Jesselyn, um, I want to know where you got the ATF playbook because everything she stated <laughs> occurred in her situation or in her client's situation has happened to me. It's a standard practice. Attack those making the allegations. The actual people involved in the uh, Fast and Furious uh, oversight, they've all, they've all prospered. Not one of them. They're all going home to their families. Brian Terry's never going to go home to his family. I think Not that's one an bit of accountability. Vince, an important point you've made is that the other people, the ones who went along, who didn't blow the whistle, who didn't even corroborate or corroborate the, the evidence, they've all been promoted. All of them have had better jobs. They've moved up the ladder, not down the ladder. The only people punished were the ones who said something is going wrong here. And I think that's very important for us to point out. Uh, Andre, um, you left your position. You walked away from a good job. Tell me what's going to happen, your future. I mean, what are your job prospects in light of of, of taking this action and speaking out so boldly? Well, we'll see what happens. I'm less concerned about my job prospects and more concerned about offering protection to uh, my former employees who I hired and who are really good workers and, and great Americans, and they shouldn't be discriminated against because they're white or right of center or happen to be conservative. It's, you know, I'm an officer of the court, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I. That doesn't set well with me. I, I couldn't accept that. Uh, you know, I, I want to say all of you, I think you're heroes. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to be heroes in this country. Sometimes it's taking up arms and wearing a uniform. And God knows I appreciate our military. But if you're willing to stand up against your own government when you think your government is wrong, uh, you become a hero because it's not an easy thing to do. And obviously, if you'd have stayed just quiet, uh, gone along, you could have gotten along and you could have probably been promoted and you would have been sitting here today. You would have been enjoying a nice weekend with your families at an increased salary for shutting up. But if people like you don't speak up and instead just shut up, we're not talking about the loss of jobs. I think we need to be very clear. We are talking about the loss of this great republic and everything we hold dear and that for which we send soldiers to fight. And if, if they're not fighting for freedom, and fighting for a government that treats us all the same, then why are we sending them? It's that serious. And I want to thank you for being here, and God knows we need more like you who will come forward and tell the truth. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Jessalyn, Thomas, Andre, and Vince, we all say thank you.